also mean assumpt uh, making the assumption here that EDG also won't like, go towards the Kha'Zix again uh, themselves. Uh, so it should be a different jungle as well. So where do WE now want to go? Because they had a very early uh, aggressive pick inside the Jax in game number one. Ala could still technically take the Jace up towards the top side. It's not something we often see these days, but uh, into the Jax does have a pretty decent one-to-one -one matchup if you, uh, you know, you change the typical runes that you would have uh, in the mid lane. So we'll see exactly where that Jace ends up slotting in, and mm, we know exactly where the true. Jax is going to go after Cube uh, had. They gave this game man game the one. Jax again. I don't know. It's uh, it's gonna be interesting. He does that to you in game one. Takes all that pressure. I don't know if you let that one through again. It is the poppy. Also a very nice comfort champ for Hung, and also something that can have a lot of that forward aggression in the early pathing. Yeah, it can also curb uh, the availability, of course, of the mobility spells that EDG have. Uh, it can be such an obnoxious, obnoxious rather ability uh, at times. So we'll see exactly how EDG potentially looks draft around it if at all uh, they do secure themselves the maokai though that is definitely the trade when we pick up this poppy and they do give over this combination to edg and you know we said execution or draft what's going to change if edg can get ahead like they did in game number one but they've got maokai jace this looks entirely different for we in terms of looking for an actual feasible comeback and they're still going to run into this ala uh, on the kennen matchup in the top side so you know you're either playing to get cube ahead or you're looking for a very similar early game plan last game where you did try and actually set Uzi and Mako quite far behind whilst trying to give Hope some resources down there as well. See if uh, any of these answers really do make means happen for EDG. While the Azir did get let through here, comes in for Shanks. It's going to be his second most played champion, but also just something that's we talked about last night, risen through the, the priority roof here. And I actually really like that pick compared with uh, Shank's kind of play style and the way that WE uses him as well. Yeah, I do agree. And Shank's just generally looks so good on the champion comparatively to a lot of the rest of his pool. So very excited to see him on so much comfort here in a series where they need to win. So pressure can definitely be alleviated off him a little bit. We know the matchup in the mid lane is going to be one where it should be relatively quiet, right? Trading health bars and mana bars at best for priority whenever the each side want it. Away from that now, we're in ban phase two and both teams focusing on the support pools for now uh, with the Alistar and the Rail ban away. I feel like if you're WE, you kind of, you might want to remove Rakan whilst also taking Zaya up mm. on the form. Zaya defensively so good uh, into things like Kennen uh, and the Maokai, uh, but you also don't necessarily want to give over uh, Rakan to this composition. They actually look more towards the Milio, perhaps scared uh, of yeah. some of the Milio pairings that are still up and available of course it's, it's so unanimously banned often in first three that i kind of forget <laughs> about it uh, at times uh, so we'll see exactly what gets left up and available now as edg have one more ban left uh, and i suspect they will also yeah. look at one of those more defensive options for we to remove away i don't know if it's uh targeting their tried and true combo of the lucian melio for uzi and mako but uh you know maybe it is uh we do get that Rakondo banned by edg on the other side to try and take away something from Iwandi in terms of that peel and give situation, but still a plethora of things to choose. We'll get bot lane focus for our final two choices on both sides. The Jinx from last game, I think can take priority. It's something that Hope has played more than anything else here in summer in the amount of games they play, but also finds himself really able to feed off the momentum that this pick gives in team fights. And that is where Hope is at his most lethal, when he can pick apart a team fight with a lot of backing. And right now, this Jinx is top priority for WE. Yeah, he has far more games on the Jinx than just about any other champion. And he's got he games nine so now. far this split. Yeah, this is going to be his ninth game. So, and I think it's like Zeri and then Aphelios or something like that afterwards. So he really has been prioritizing this Jinx, despite the Meru in. Uh, we could just see Varus Hyman. Let's go! Oh, man. They're like... We saw Weibo come out with a very similar composition not too long ago when they were dealing with an Aphelios. You can kind of do the same thing to Jinx as well. Uh, yeah. Ash could be a, a slightly different take on it, right? Give you a little more DPS as well, as opposed to the Varus, uh, while still kind of giving you a lot of that vision and information. So I like this as well. Ash Haim in lane, going to be quite okay. obnoxious to deal with. I now, And this is where things get kind of tricky for Iwandi, because like, if you pick hard engage, you probably, you die like a majority of the time. So you probably want an enchanter eyeing up the karma this will be a very interesting route to go i think you want something that keeps at bay 
uh, EDG whilst also kind of just sitting quite far back uh, here in this one. And you're just trying to contest priority. And Iwandi is definitely the perfect kind of player to have uh, something like this karma in his back pocket. So I like that WE. Don't just fall prey and go, you know what, fine, we'll send the Nautilus and we'll have this form of engage. They do just look to try and uh, neutralize out uh, with a little more uh, Enchanter kind of flavor to the composition. So now yeah. WE. Comparably to game one, Mazel have a lot more zone control and the ability to actually lock down areas and make things very, very difficult for WE to actually approach reasonably. So now, if they secure an early game lead, I suspect that they'll be a lot more happy to pull the trigger <laughs> on something like the Baron. Yeah, a lot more utilitarian focus as well from Uzi here, actually, very interestingly enough. But it is setting eyes on Fofo, right? They said... Yeah, we saw what you did on LeBlanc in game one. Let's have some more of that. But this time on the Jace, take it away from Shanks, but also give you so much strength around these objectives and around the entrance to those objectives. We know EDG have a lot of strength when it comes to controlling the map, controlling neutral objectives. But in game one, it was actually WE who answered a lot of that, who had a lot of control around the map. And now with Iwandi on an Enchanter that he feels comfortable with, and a very interesting 2v2 in the bottom lane that will lead to uh, curious things when it comes to objective control and spacing, like you were saying. It's going to be a slugfest in game number two and see if WE's home arena can help them secure a clean sweep or if EDG will actually make this a series and prolong this night and give themselves a little breathing room in this game, Jamada. I'm sure we'll get some loud Jios just like we did in game number one, but game two will be kicking off now. All eyes on what EDG can make of it. Even louder, no doubt. Uh, WE won the game up. You can hear him. And the hype man specifically very Woo, loud. EDG. Ooh. My good, this is WE's home arena. Goodness me, EDG fans. Very, very loud nonetheless. I like this from WE though. Wrap around. Oh, don't no. meet, don't oh, meet them in the no. bottom brush. Oh, Wait for them no. to check. Oh. Uzi, don't do it. I can't look. Oh my God, WE. They might have had the cheers for EDG, but it's all early game for WE to straight kill. Oh, what a good read from WE. Normally, right, when you have High Manigra in the game, you want to fight over this bottom brush priority. You want to try and ensure that he doesn't get these turrets down quickly. So what do WE do? Because they expect the five-man stack. They five-man stack, but they just go through the river, wrap back around towards the dry bush because they know at that point then Uzi, Mako, someone is going to walk back into that bush, surely. And the walk around pays off. They get two kills for their troubles, and one of those goes into Cube's hands, no less. After a game one like that, I don't think you're going to be too upset with him picking up the first early kill. And now, yeah, uh, this top side of the map is going to be so influential. Hung so influential there. Also, side note, uh, four sorcery trees there for EDG. A lot of blue. Uh, you know, my favorite color referencing from earlier. But specifically now, what WE does with this advantage, right? I, I think you can find a lot of strength if Hung keeps up the tempo. But you see opposite side starts for both junglers. Opposite side. Uh, no invade shenanigans this time around, right? Uh, I wonder how JJ is going to path, considering the bottom side of his map now doesn't really have as much priority as you would have expected off of the level one, uh, because Hope and I won. They obviously had a little bit of a one-up in finding those two kills on the bottom side. Uh, he was also blown by Mako. I don't think it's going to have too much impact, but we'll see how things this go. This is as beautiful. Hung. Three camp clear into a top side gank. Super easy to set up here. Arla's still going to be level two. Yeah. And this is something JJ knows so well. He's going to be saying, Allah, I should have told you about it. Allah will burn that flash. Not going to go down, but that's still a lot of pressure. Much better look in this game number two, right? Now Cube is under a lot less pressure. The JJ now wants this bottom side. Yeah, that's awkward, isn't it? <laughs> Preemptive uh, ghost there from Uzi. Just trying to get some heavy trades, actually, into Hope. Yeah, I mean, yeah, a little bit chunk out, but still, you would have preferred a, an overall actual gank to actually come through here from JJ doesn't end up working out and yeah much better look from WE overall right you alleviate some pressure off of QP also obviously got that first blood gold uh, didn't have to blow the teleport even to get back up here uh, on time either so everything generally just set up a little bit better in the early game whilst they also have Shanks just silently sat in the mid lane scaling up and he's going to do that for a while on this Azir so this is definitely a positive 
outlook now and EDG have to just do what they can to regain some control in terms of, you know, trying to set up base and the bomb side of the map. Now that WE, uh, I want the hope have reset again, could be the area that they look to try and lock down. Yeah, a little bit of vertical jungling, but it actually goes the way of Hung because he was able to take a majority of that jungle up there and now going to answer Jiejie, who was pushed out by Awandi and Hope on that reset. Jiejie's in some trouble now. He has flash. He's going to have to burn it, but right into Hope's waiting arms here with the zap. Hung not able to follow it up, though. They don't have as much damage, and Uzi and Mako were on their way, so really good cover from the bot lane from EDG. Yeah, Hung was looking for the angle onto that bottom side of the Dragon Pit wall for the stun. If he finds it, Jiejie just dies, I think. Too much CC at that point. And I wonder he would have caught up for the route as well. So it was a little bit bad, but EDG get away with a little bit of murder considering they shouldn't have still been around there. JJ a little bit of greedy pathing after failing that blue buff invader. Now he is actually being invaded on the back end. Both junglers have smite. And I think Kung knows JJ is there, maybe. We'll see. He's definitely going to see him now. And he got it. He got it, by the way. I think. Wow. One through the smite. Well then, that's uh, one way to do it. And now he's just... <laughs> Forcing uh, DJ away from this one. He's going to go for the engage. Fofo's right here as well. Shank, Shank's trying to actually follow up, but decent damage on the DJ means that EDG have to back he can away. Keep doing this. He can keep doing that as well. You're going to see him on the minimap just constantly follow DJ around as Cube. Does he have the damage for this? I... It's not the first oh, time we got fights all over. All right. Let's see if Hung actually finding it on Mako. What a huge play, man. He will just go down. Not going to give a shutdown over, but Uzi should be able to pick. Actually, JJ gets it with the sapling uh, in the end as Uzi's going to go back to lane. But a bit of an overextend, but a nice little capitalization. Maybe a quick back for Hung. Yeah, exactly. Hung feels pretty good about this early pathing here as really. Now, again, neither me nor Nazel. Nazel? Nazel are uh, literate. In That's my name. Mandarin. But that looks like Jax has won three games into Kennen when Kennen's considered the counter pick. Anyway, uh, Hex Flash over the wall, a little bit sketch, but does eventually find Mako with the buckle up. Doctor gets run down for troubles. Hope was still on, on the wave. Right feels maybe with Iwandi straight away, then maybe they can look for a turnaround collapse and he can hold his ground. But unfortunately, not the case. Does die for his troubles. He goes back to base, picks up tier two boots and a ruby crystal. So yeah. he wants to run around Mazel and he wants to find more plays ASAP. Kind of like where EDG were last game. Need to just keep the momentum going. We'll be spotted out on this top side, so some decent information for EDG, and that's where I want to check in, because uh, it's a very different state of game than what we had last time. Yes, Cube is still losing. He's not losing by 50 CS, but EDG are in a much stabler spot than they were with their comp in last game. Do we feel the same for WE? Is now they're getting pressed in mid lane. Luckily, Iwandi shows up, and they won't find anything in the 2v2. Nothing for now. I do feel a lot better about WE and where they were comparatively to game one and two. I will say again, if EDG, because we're still only six minutes in, it feels like there's been a lot of action. And I think in part that is mm -hmm. just because Hung has been so aggressive in looking for these opportunities. But we are only seven minutes in. So for EDG, the game is still very much like within uh, arm's reach. It's just about how or how they are denied the ability to actually pick up some of these early objectives, right? First Dragon, first Herald, uh, and how WE play around them. I am spikes as well, pretty big for EDG generally. First item for Arlo and JJ should be pretty massive spikes. Fofo needs realistically two. And of course, Uzi Mako uh, will kind of slowly scale up with this game, and they're more about zone control than outright okay. damage in many instances. So no TPs available on EDG's side. They want to take this fight. They want something of an advantage here, but maybe WE wanted that fight. They weren't waiting for Arlo, who had that slicing maelstrom, and I want he's just gone. That was some help from uh, the Infernal Dragon as well. WE immediately run away from the situation and Dragon goes to EDG as well as a kill. Yeah, good roam from Ala. Recognizes how important this top, uh, this bottom side Dragon will be. They pick up the first one of the game because of it. And yeah, WE, I just don't think we're expecting the uh, cannon in the bush, to be entirely honest. So really good play and read from EDG and WE just caught a little bit lacking by that cannon, and the Fofo will just catch this top wave, so even though Q picks up a plate, it's not really the biggest loss in the world, considering what you get on the opposite side of the map. Should take a look back at the replay of that fight. Ala just waiting in the wings, and it was too late to pull away, as the Enchanted Crystal Arrow also helping a lot for Uzi there, actually, in the end. But uh, we're right back to it now, and Rift Herald is what is in play next, at least. 
We'll see what the play is there, though, with a lot of vision from W on bottom side already. Yeah, JJ is just shadowing the bottom side of the map because he knows Hung is likely going to be around here. And even though there's vision uh, available for EDG, he just doesn't want to let anything suspicious end up going on. So uh, drop some saplings, clear some wards. Just be careful he doesn't get caught out by Hung here. They're actually looking oh. for a guy. Oh. Hung's coming right around the corner. He has the Keeper's Verdict. That's the cleanse out. They might be able to do this and get out in time. Oh, Mako gets locked down, though. And that's a big pick out in the end of a return. But two kills had gone over. And you do get something back here for EDG on the bottom side in a big wave crashing. Yeah, and I mean, Hope is going to miss all of that. And, you know, we spoke about the CS lead that was uh, accrued in the top side of the map by Arla into Cube last game. It it's kind of repeating itself on the bottom side, huh? It is. Easy is uh, picking up plates too, so we'll see how fed this Ash gets. Also looks like uh, Uzi is going to be opting in to the static ship, considering his components, so that's going to be an additional facet of wave clear between him uh, and Mako, which will be very, very obnoxious once they make it to the mid lane as well. But for now, not at this top side of the map. Mako is. Uzi has to likely go down towards the bottom side, maybe, depending on how EDG are feeling. If they want to contest this, they bring Uzi up. If they want to kind of fake contest it, make things a little bit awkward for WE, then they can send them to the bottom side of the map and just maybe get another extra plate. Also, solo XP, all of that stuff. Seems like, though, both teams are a little bit indecisive. You can kind of see by the movements, yeah. right? Wandi looking to maybe just kind of secure a little bit of soft vision down here on the bottom side, catch out a rotation from Uzi, maybe. But at the end of it, now that both teams are finished fe feeling each other out, JJ will be the one sure, that gets the trap. Pretty sure barrel. Uzi took one little chicky nuggy there. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Just wanted to see the proc of the uh, static shift since he's got that one completed as well. First item in the game. Uh, we'll see if getting back towards bottom lane is going to be the mission goal for both these two teams as now Rift Herald goes to EDG. And they're right in the right state of mind as well. They typically go for a lot of objective controls, a lot of map controls, and they're getting it here in game two. Yeah, this is perfect. That's what the composition wants to do as well. Maokai, Jace, Ashheim. First move into the river is going to be crucial. Actually, for both these teams, the more you think about it, Poppy's so good at defending ground with the Keeper's Verdict, and of course the Steadfast Presence stops any dashes. Not that there's three really many in this game, it's realistically just Fofo, but you get the idea, right? Very stalwart defense kind of champion. And of course, Shanks, I think, needs no explanation on the Azir and what the Sand Soldiers can get done. So first move into the next objective specifically is going to be crucial throughout the game. We're going to have to track mid lane priority and how both these teams want to actually enter the river and how well they can defend their vision respectively it's gonna be a little bit difficult but you know one thing that helps in that fashion is uh maybe some side lane pressure as Allah and cube tussling in that regard there is still also the matter of spacing that ddg honestly feel like they have a lot of advantages in now a keeper verdict changes that all around but it, it, if edg are the ones that are entering an already started objective it feels like w are going to be on the back foot that's, that's, oh, no. oh, oh that's just the combo right under oh, tower. You're asking for help, but no help is coming. Yeah, I wanted to just got one shot. Did it? This is why, like, when you used to see like Faris plus Heim, occasionally you would see both laners just take cleanse, just so they could like yeah. not have to deal with that. And that's pretty much a case study as to why. But uh, Mako Uzi find one bit of CC, and it turns into so much. Like, like, how much? Oh, Uzi. <laughs> oh. Uzi. Uzi. Okay, okay. Hey, oh playing God, on knife's a, edge, all right? Day and night, day and man. night. You, no, day and night, my backside, he nearly killed himself. <laughs> Don't so worry risky. about it. Don't worry about it. JJ in a little bit of trouble. Just trying to defend his laners who are backing in the bush. Luckily, they both make it out <laughs> very, very close. So Rylai's does get completed for Mako. All right. So Rylai's, like you said, completed for Mako. And that's going to just make, again, you know, WE not making it in. Uh, to objectives first, even rougher. So grenade into arrow into death. He had no opportunity to use a slash. That felt fun. As a oh, cube. oh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. A little antsy there, Ala. Little antsy. Was a uh, uh, now. To, can you blame him given cube? Oh track no, record? I can't. Because given, given cube's track record of aggressive flashes forward this series, can you blame him? To Don't be go honest? back. Like, Don't go back. Don't don't go back, oh. Allah. <laughs> Run away. There's an angry so, woman with a rocket. Yeah, that's that's why the observer was hovering between Hope and Allah. There was anticipating a uh, 
potential super mega death rocket doesn't end up coming through in the end. So Harrow will be dropped here on the bomb side, but this this is a good tempo swing for EDG yeah, even is. further ahead. Even though the top tower the top tower is secured, this is gonna be two charges on a solo plate gold for the tier one into a tier two, which even if it's shared by Mako and Uzi together, is gonna be a massive amount of gold. So yeah. I feel like even though WE, you know, get gold into the members that I suppose they, you know, want in this specific exchange, is it really worth it in the grand scheme of things when you lose out on this much map control against a composition like this who want to strangle you out in vision? And you're wondering if, you know, a little bit of sideline pressure for Hope gives him something. I, I do really like the Jinx still in a lot of these situations, depending on how the team fights go, but it really is going to be a situation where EDG... Going off of last game, they looked good for like 90% of that game. They were in control. They were winning. And uh, now they just feel a lot more stable, a lot more stalwart. So we get another item completion uh, really coming across for everyone. Uh, Evan Shroud there for ZIDA, but more importantly, the Dusk Blade completed for Fofo as well. So a lot of the poke coming through in the cutout potential of EDG is starting to come online. Yeah, it certainly is. And for WE, you wonder. Now, as EDG start to take control of, uh, you know, sort of mid lane pressure specifically through Uzi and through Mako, uh, how will WE handle the vision denial and eventual shutdown that they were actually, you know, kind of on the same end of last game, but with different tools and more defensive tools on the side of EDG. Saplings, Maokai, uh, plus, of course, Heimerdinger. It's all going to be very, very frustrating to get through. And WE, I feel like are kind of in a very similar boat where uh -oh. they have to wait. Oh boy. For a long time. I'm just going to get brought back there. There's nothing really he can do, but he's still taking up a storm. He's going to get the flash out. Not able to get it is Uzi, oh. but Hope is going to take the brunt of Uzi's ire. And Uzi comes up big. We got to get him cut out here, though. As I want, he's trying oh to take him God. down. He's healing a lot. He what? takes out another. And that's huge for EDG. He can't get the third, though. Mako on the other side of Dodge. But it doesn't matter because WE have crumbled to dust. Uzi just space glided on all of WE there, even if he's the only one to go down. He just embarrassed everyone and it gave enough time for EDG to come in and collapse. That was insane. No fear at all as he just walked forward on everyone and ran them down. That was crazy. Don't need no breaks if all you do is go forward. Starting it off with that enchanted crystal arrow and following it through. Yeah, so hung is very very tanky and i think the fact that jj doesn't commit the ultimate oh. at the very start of this fight makes things a little bit awkward hope tries to just cleanse and get away but unfortunately with all the approach velocity movement speed in the back end of ghost it was a little bit too difficult the stun here from mako also stops shags from potentially flash walling uh uzi and he just one shot saiwandi and also the knockback from fofo we didn't catch that in live yeah. is what stopped q from getting on top of him immediately but once he does get him, he obviously dies, but it doesn't matter because he's effectively 1v4. <laughs> the entirety of WE with movement alone must EDG came into collapse. Look at that 4K damage. 4k damage. Woo! Uzi is he on He almost did more than the entire team of WE. Uh, I was still a little bit off that, but yeah, goodness gracious. And we talked about it at the beginning. What a beautiful setup. We didn't get it in game number one, but man, Uzi is coming alive in game two. He does not want to give up. He does not want this series to end in a 2-0 for WE. And EDG have propped themselves up in a big gold lead here. Yeah, they have. It's loomed over 5K now. And it will continue to grow where before the Baron is up. So EDG, at my previous request of put the, the pedal to the metal, Cannot quite do that just yet, but the next dragon spawns up in 45 seconds time, a little bit more, and once they pick that up, they will only have the Baron to focus on for the foreseeable future. For now though, in the immediate, the Herald is up and they can take this and WE certainly can't really find any contest. They'll try and cross map this tower on the bottom side, so clawing back a little bit of gold, but at the end of the day, it still feels like it pales in comparison, but whatever you can get is always going to feel like a little bit of a win, and we do have objective bounties up, so I guess it'll be a slightly bigger injection of cash, but still... Nothing in comparison to what EDG are getting right now and what they are likely to pick up as well as they approach that dragon in 20 seconds. Now we did see EDG with the lead. Now I was saying earlier, different composition, different feeling, but 
We have seen them fumble the bag already, Jamada. We gotta see them continue to cross their T's, doubt their eyes. The theme of the day, apparently. Dragon is up. This is sole point for EDG. Textbook League of Legends is what EDG now need to accomplish. Cube Textbooks are expensive. Line. Textbooks are expensive. I was gonna say something then, but I'm not sure. I, you know what? I'm not gonna say it. It's it's to do with how you can get <laughs> textbooks. Uh, uh -huh, know, uh -huh, we live uh -huh. in a we live in a smart age, people. Just we live in a society. Universe. We live in a society. That's for sure. Hope is gonna have to use lens there. <laughs> well, I'm <aimed> by Uzi. <laughs> it's about to start getting real meta real quick there for a second. Uh, but now with that dragon off the map and dragon or baron rather spawning in under 60 seconds time they will put this herald down just to secure the tower and i mean again you know tower here what this is realistically going to do is just open up the map even more hung is on well a flank <laughs> <laughs> i don't know he, if that's one you want to take there I, I don't know if he wants it that's that's obviously the difference now uh, I, I do have a serious question though because there there was we can't shy away from what happened in game one and while, yes, WE's complex is a little different, it still feels in the same way. Do we still see a light at the end of the tunnel where WE's comp scales to infinity oh. and maybe makes it in uh, to get Ala in the side lane, actually? Slicing Maelstrom does come through. This is not a 2v1 that he wins, though, and nobody is here to respond. The flash comes out, and WE will have to back away. <laughs> they just dealt no damage to him, did they? <laughs> like, there was no damage baked between Hung and Cube, so he just walks out for free. Um, yeah, very, very difficult, isn't it? I do like the point that you bring up, right? Do you just try and make side lane picks? Do you just forego team fighting overall because you know you can never really reclaim territory around these objectives? Maybe, but I feel like we just saw a pretty decent example of that attempt. And yeah, Ala can start to build defensively after he goes this Shadow Flame as well, right? Things like the Zonyas can really slow okay. things down. So yeah, for WE, I think this might be an insurmountable one. We'll have to see as they get on top of the Baron. And Hung is... On the top side, he's in the tri brush, and he's been spotted out. Not gonna happened. let him get back into the game this time. Baron will not be stolen by the super mega death rocket, and uh, we will actually see DG with consistent control in this game number two. Very very hard, I think, for WE to rest control back. I just don't feel like they have any relevant tools to do so. They just have to pray. Again, on an EDG mistake like what we saw from game number one, like you said, it's on our minds because of how big that lead was. And we're almost there, Mazel. Like 500 more gold and they have as big a lead as they did in game one. However, it did take them a lot longer to get there. It definitely comparison. did. And they, they still have so much time that they need to really get anything under. They, they are not even close to even three items there for a lot of members. And we're going to be getting close for EDG as they do take a tier 2 tower in the top side. They'll get their backs off with a quick reset of the Baron buff. And get back onto the map where, you know, everything's looking peachy dandy for them. And the resets are going to be huge to get that third item spike for Uzi. As well as just getting back onto the bottom side of the map and get ready for their soul. That's going to be coming up in two minutes. Yep. Again, on the eyes, crossing the T's will be the chapter of this particular textbook for EDG. And they still have to do it one more time if they win out because of how <laughs> things ended last game. But definitely, the questions were asked from us. What will it be? Adaptation in gameplay or adaptation in draft? And it seems like adaptation in draft definitely was the port of call as they've kind of approached the game in a very similar way. And now it's just about suffocation. There's no more towers outside of the base. There's very limited wave clear on the side of WE, and it's just about syncing up these waves and getting them there at the same time. That's why Arla is slow pushing this wave down here, so he can pressure this bottom side tower as Uzi and Fofo with this ultimate in support from JJ. Woo! Force Hope back. Still gets get caught the by the Nature's Grasp in the end, as well as the Inhib Tower in mid and bot under siege. See if EDG can get this Inhib down. They do in mid lane as well, or at least and now looking bot lane as well. Uh, they should be able to get another one down, and it just means W are on the back foot continuously here, 23 minutes in. This is, this is what EDG wanted to be doing last game. But it's just so much more difficult because of the composition they had this time around. Poke tools, zoning tools, defensive tools. Doesn't matter if Cube's on the side lane. He's not going to achieve much. He's going to teleport back now, but Mazel 
I feel oh like it's too God. little too late. If they can find the big keeper's verdict into an immediate numbers advantage, okay, maybe? Okay, okay. JJ is gone, but Slicey Maelstrom is still there. And point and present are the EDG oh. as a snipe comes through from Fofo. The bouncing grenade connects and everything from WE has fallen apart in game two. We get a series delivered straight to our doorstep. And it's EDG who have awoken. They needed to warm up in game one and boy, are they warmed up. A huge win from them. Yeah, massive win. And they needed it after game number one. They needed their head shaken a bit, probably in the back room. I imagine it was and definitely reflected in the gameplay. A lot more decisive. And this draft felt a lot more playable as well.